Welcome to the first episode of The Makeup Historian. I'm your host, Sarah Long, a professional makeup artist turned history professor. Now, to get the show off on a strong start, I thought it would be best to showcase a conversation between two historians, rather than throwing at you one of our more, how do you say, um, (laughs) controversial interviews. Because most people really don't understand all of the different challenges historians are working through right now. And honestly, how would you? Historians aren't exactly getting their own reality TV shows or getting weekly segments on on the local news and different talk shows because the common perception is that our work is boring and that most people just want to hear about it after the fact, after we've done all of the research and it's all nice and pretty and published. And we don't really tell people too much about all of that work, all of the struggles that we have to deal with in order to make those different publications happen. And if you are one of those people, my guess would be that you probably hated history class growing up because maybe you had a teacher who was super monotone and you just fell asleep during every single lesson. Well, get ready to change your mind about history because 21st century historians are different and we really are taking on so much more than people realize. I also just want to clarify for everyone. I'm not a professional podcast host. (laughs) I'm a history professor. (laughs) And the more I conduct these interviews, the more I realize just how similar all of this is to writing. Or I should probably say editing, but hear me out. Have you ever written a paper and stepped away for a few hours or maybe a few days and then came back and read it and just cringed at all of the mistakes you've made? Well, (laughs) I'm noticing it's the same thing for podcasts because when I go back and I listen to some of the very first interviews I did, I'll occasionally, uh, you know, notice a, a noise in the background, whether that's a door closing or someone typing, or sometimes for whatever reason, I was just really feeling one particular word and said it so many times for God only knows why. But as much as those mistakes may make me cringe, I'm just going to have to deal with it because I'm not editing them out. That wouldn't be authentic, and this really wouldn't be a true history podcast if I did that. I'm not here to give you a perfect little podcast and throw a bunch of commercials at you with various discounts for whatever product. That's not the goal. Like I mentioned in the trailer, the goal of the show is to showcase honest discussions about the beauty and blemishes of different societies throughout the world and throughout time but it's also to give a more behind the scenes viewpoint of historical examination. So some episodes will be the traditional oral history interview approach where I barely speak at all because it's not really my place to provide additional commentary. However, Other episodes will be very different from that, meaning they are not the traditional oral history interview because it will be more of a very active dialogue about a particular issue we are dealing with right now. And sometimes those topics really do uh, warrant more of a response on my part because I have a direct connection to them, whether that be something that I am associated with or my own personal lived experiences, it will change. Not every episode is going to be exactly the same and it's not always going to be, here's my nice introduction and and here's our transition music, oh, and here's our interview and this is what we learned and da-da-da-da. No. Like I said, this is not the traditional history podcast and I'm not here to bore you to death. I, I mean... There are plenty of other teachers who can do that. I don't want to be another one of them. (laughs) My goal is to actually have you fall in love with history again and to take protecting it very seriously. So now that we clarified all of that, I can finally introduce my guest for the first episode, which was my very dear friend, Jennifer Keel. Not only do I have nothing but absolute respect and admiration for her, but she continuously inspires me. So it would be very selfish to not share with everyone all of the amazing things she's doing. 
Like myself, Jennifer acquired her training from Cal State Fullerton, and when she was a student, a lot of her research focused on the lived experiences of Americans during World War II and even post-war consumer society. She also worked as a graphic and web designer and participated in the California Association of Museums and the American Alliance of Museums. No big deal right? So it's no surprise that she quickly established a name for herself as an oral and public history professional, but also as a digital historian. Mind you, everything I just said is only the tip of the iceberg. As of today, she serves as the first vice president of the Southwest Oral History Association and runs her own organization, 70 Degrees, which provides exhibition, editing, preservation, and design services. I mean, this is what I'm saying. I can't keep up with her. <laughs> and if you want to learn more about her background, be sure to check out the website for 70 Degrees, which is 70degrees.org. My conversation with Jennifer tackled a lot of different topics, but the main ones were the poor historian myth, digital history, and how others like us are helping to redefine what it means to be a historian. So I won't spoil anything else for you, and I can't wait for you guys to listen. Letting me be a part of this. I'm very excited for this endeavor to educate your community about what a historian may look like, sound like, and do professionally. And so to add value to this conversation, um, I'm just delighted that we get to work together. Yeah. (laughs) Share my business 70 (laughs) degrees. So you joining the um, advisory board has been just a phenomenal experience for us. Thank you for that. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's really a wonderful collaboration with your your background and I I think for listeners it's always great to share how we met and where that took place and so we are formally trained historians we studied at yes the Lawrence B. DeGraff Center for Oral and Public History which is at Cal State Fullerton and the history department there has been really using social he- like history methods since the early late 60s early 70s and engineered Mm -hmm. A very open way of practicing history, which I am forever grateful because I gain, like, not only just knowledge of the past, but, like, tools to, like, help preserve it as it happens and how to um, capture and save things that would have been lost otherwise. And it was very, like, a tactical um, experience with museum internships. And we really had, I think, an amazing mentors that allowed us to like do site visits to go through boxes in the archives to work with librarians and at the nixon to hey we need to yeah i had no idea how just how lucky we really (laughs) were and we were talking about this yesterday um you know like it fullerson's in our backyard Mm -hmm. so i was telling you i got i just went because that was where i got accepted randomly (laughs) got lucky to you know end up in one of the top history departments but um no i actually Gosh, of course, I forgot something. I was going to tell everyone the reason I really wanted you to come on the show is, Mm. one, not only because you were one of the few people who watched me make that really random transition and kind of, you know, establish, like begin to establish a name for myself in history, but you you really understand, you know, the main focus of this episode, Mm -hmm. which is this myth Mm. of the poor historian Mm. and everything you were mentioning about your business 70 degrees and cough and and fullerton Mm. these are all great examples to kind of help us debunk that myth because it's not true and it really breaks my heart every Mm. time i i have to hear that especially from even my students Mm -hmm. or or sometimes even people that we went to school with still kind of believe this myth Mm -hmm. and it's really sad and i'm just kind of perplexed by that so you know, I thought it would be good to kind of talk this out mm-hmm. with you and maybe sure. try to better understand why this is a very common narrative sure. in our society right now. And yeah, I think it just starts politically with funding. Um, I think part of the conversation has been if we value societally these programs, like from the national foundations to the statewide, um, we should value it with money behind it. And I, it's concerning because, you know, with STEM education, we are reintegrating the arts back into that narrative. They kind of forgot 
how central the humanities and the arts are to just general education. And so, unfortunately, when it's, it's a budgetary line item sometimes, and so these you know field trips to local history sites and classrooms, I hear all the time from educators that um, when they are just administrators are looking at just baseline numbers. Um, Arts can be costly. I think materially, um, you have to um, invest in them. And so I think the matter of just finding um, corporate sponsors, I think, is our answer to a lot of these things. We have to take business school ideas of if you're an entrepreneur, you mm -hmm. can self-fund, you can build a portfolio, you build your clientele, you build sponsorships into nonprofit entities. And these roles, like there are formal positions in being uh, developer officers for nonprofits because it's a huge part of like operation budgets is like how do we um, continue offering all these amazing programs to the community, th these museums that we frequent, if there's not a cost per se to the public, it may be a, a zero dollar item to them, but there's definitely a corporate sponsor that's making that possible. And so that's why I love like organizations like Bowers who work with Target and they're like, we can offer, you know, an amazing array of programming, live music and like engaged in a whole drama and just like fashion right now is a, an exhibit that they're featuring. And the public itself, who's so deserving to hear and learn from the past and tangibly witness and um, those like interactive exhibit displays that we work on. They, you know, they deserve to see and know their own history. And so, like, I, I think it's just this myth because we, we like, allow it to be and we need to be self-starters. And so when I was a museum director and it was like I had a budget and I had a board and they had <laughs> <laughs> certain, you know, capabilities. Of, but when I... Um, when we have this like idea, it's like, well, we need a bigger building. Well, then we just need more funding. It's a simple answer. And it's just a matter of networking and going through our contact list to think about strategy, um, who we can um, encourage and, and increase their awareness of the great programs we already offer. And then with their financial con contributions could expand that. And so that's yeah. when I worked with Ray from oh, our program. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's a development, and it was so cool to like be Ray is connected. A he at fundraising. he is just his I, company oh, is allowing <laughs> many nonprofits to not he's only just like survive, you. Every but time I talk to each of you, it's like, oh yeah, I'm involved in this, this, yeah. this, and I'm like, I was gone for three weeks. Like, what happened? And now you have all of these new projects. Energy wise, like. <laughs> In parallel, you used a lot of fun. I just draw from that. <laughs> like, this is why we have this cohort that I loved, like, going to school with you guys because I draw on that and I get yeah. inspired by your passions. And so um, we're trying to, like, help the next generation. Speaking of, like, demystifying, like, the department's creating, like, an alumni council. And so we actually, Ray and I joined as, like, is new program to say we need to like have more transparency of like what real industry can look like as far as job placement as far mm -hmm. as opportunities and so this episode is very timely because we're in the midst <laughs> of like redefining what it means to be a history major i didn't even plan that <laughs> yeah, just a nice little plug to the department because yeah we, that was a very kismet yeah, moment it was really <laughs> great. i really did yeah. i legitimately yeah. did not plan that I had no idea we are just like at a moment where we want to like increase funding for scholarship we want to increase their travel funds so that they can go to more archives and so mm -hmm. like that's my direct hope yeah, is see, like to help everything that you that. just yeah everything you just listed I mean you're talking about this approaching history like historical study mm -hmm. with almost this business me methodology essentially it seems and to work. <laughs> and it's like see these are the things that we mm -hmm. talk about all the time and that's why I'm I'm a little bit nervous, you know, right. that people still think that this is that essentially historians are just kind of tucked away in a sure. library and right. or an archive and never talk to anyone all mm -hmm. day. And that's not, not true. Not a public <laughs> there historian. There are some days are. where <laughs> we're in the I'm books, locked away in, the in an archive. We do but, our research. Yeah. But, you know, but that we yeah. do have a lot of different hats yes. that we essentially need to wear, especially in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And we're not really publicizing or even discussing this sure. enough amongst each other let alone in our society today and you mentioned something too about politics like how there's politics within academia right. that we have to address and then mm -hmm. just national politics right. that because this myth isn't just going on throughout our schools it is on the national 
political stage mm -hmm. right now. You know, there are a lot of politicians who think humanities majors are not necessary mm -hmm. anymore in today's society. And I, I mean, I'm right. interested to hear your <laughs> take on that. Right. I know how my feelings, mm -hmm. but I know it's in, it impacts our mm -hmm. students now because even when they come into my classes, mm -hmm. you know, they kind of approach it like, all right, this is my general ed class. I exactly. got to part of my and, study. Yeah. And then move on to mm -hmm. the next thing. And it's just, it's kind of sad because then we're essentially you know, we're missing the people sure. who could become the next historian, exactly. historian, oral historian. Yeah, yeah. Of so opportunity. I'm curious how you feel about that side or um, that aspect well, of this myth. It just needs like we need to readdress that through helping society capture its own history. I think grassroots social history is powerful, and like mm -hmm. in terms of we need nationally. Um, kind of in a state of crisis as far as like valuing these type of narratives but as you know we we both are a part of the Southwest Oral History Association like part of our network is to engineer new projects and sustain existing ones and first person account perspectives are incredibly valuable and I think it's trying to kind of break the myth of history is of the greats of great philosophers of great politicians of great wealth and social history in the 70s broke all that like standard of what is we redefined it and we're kind of in a new stage of that where I feel like society um, is trying to figure out its identity as far as like national narrative to state and local like it's just in a state of rede redefinition and I think part of that's just anniversary years in general like I've been a part of centennials and mm -hmm. you know cities ask themselves who are we what's our history who founded this why how long and timeline it and so um it's just kind of a state of we wait until anniversary years but we should be more like involved with our society to help them ask those questions frequently and i think oral historians do that in a way because they create projects thematically about um, a shared experience so sometimes it's war sometimes it's of one's um, career, sometimes it's politics, sometimes it's just merely um, witnessing an event, an atrocity sometimes, unfortunately, or maybe the joys of um, a su success in society, like they all um, help found a, a organization that has really made a significant change, like like women voters, for instance, they have projects mm -hmm. stored at COF, and so I think like we have to contribute by um, listening to our society's needs and making them slow down because we're such an instant age and yeah, a story a long a format challenge. story <laughs> especially like an hour plus narrative doesn't sound attractive to this next generation because they're by you know it's not even minutes it's now a seconds mm -hmm. kind of attention span and so we need to help them with media, um, that's why I think our experiences in the public history experimental exhibition route need to be interactive and cater to the audience needs, but never sway from the academy and the tradition that we do the hard research. We, you know, present our ideas thematically. We organize our galleries based on um, a variety of topical things, and so we don't sway from that, but we can really adapt ourselves in a way that we're still savvy and social and on Snapchat <laughs> and allowing our guests right. to get yeah. like museum filters <laughs> and think that they're standing by the Mona Lisa when they're in the West Coast or yeah. like make comparisons of what is a West Coast persona of a Mona Lisa like draw those national international like connections for them so that when they visit those sites they get a sense of like, oh, I, I witnessed something similar to that in a museum setting so that now they have enough background to go anywhere and have enough like versatility and language to like convey um, ideas. Like that's our goal with, you know, gallery design is to say line of sight and lighting and to evoke some sort of emotion. And so if we can let our like audience draw something from that, we've done our job well, if we mm -hmm. can stir a conversation. And so that's when we do our vid visitor audience surveys, like, what did you <laughs> see today? How did it make you feel? Like, we're always doing studies on even our audiences to improve, like, their experience to really stay, like, uh, like centric um, yeah. to their perspectives. And so it's difficult, I think, because society is so complex and multiple, like, as far as agencies, like, we're funded by 
you know, corporate history, um, you know, can be um, an outlet, but, you know, there's always the idea of um, how do you present them in a light that's honest and then, but also preserves them in a way as, as they should be. And so like Blizzard, um, bands locally and then the coach archivists like they track down all their bags and they historically redesign them and so like everybody we like subconsciously buy products but like even corporate structures have these sort of like researchers and people who keep things on shelves and id them and study mm -hmm. them because brand identity and like even in that sense like it helps with your marketing your storytelling and if we see it in terms of business it's a good business practice to know your own like strengths and yeah. your cycles of timeline of where you've been and where you're going so i've seen that personally as a is a great um orange county phenomenon of like some of these unique brands of like surf lifestyle that they um, are familiar with their founders history and they're very proud of that and so it helps define the cities in which they were like created out of and so like mm -hmm. surf culture especially and it also kind of makes me really sad you know you're talking about this younger generation mm -hmm. how they they are living in the age of instant gratification yes. and how that you know their <laughs> attention span is not minutes it's seconds sometimes but you know some people in some aspects mm -hmm. that may be a negative thing not all the time though sure. and actually it it's actually pretty disheartening because a lot of like our you know the brand brand new mm -hmm. college students that i get would be the perfect people to get into the public and oral history mm -hmm. side of our industry but they don't know about it sure. but I mean even just us doing this podcast all the technical things and you know us trying <laughs> yeah. to market our businesses and and you know did all these different outlets like that this is what they essentially were conditioned and trained mm -hmm. to do their entire life because they grew up mm -hmm. in this digital age and with social media and it's kind of I feel like sometimes we're kind of missing it like right. we and we don't share it enough with them there because they're so focused on all the the STEM, you know, mm -hmm. side careers. And sure. I'm not denying that they're incredibly powerful and necessary mm -hmm. in our society, but I just don't think we market this profession yes. and this aspect yes. of history enough to this particular age bracket mm -hmm. because whether, I mean, they don't realize just how great they could be mm -hmm. in this industry. So, you know, I mean, that makes me really sad from like an educator perspective, right. but and then not only that, but some people don't even know what public and oral history Maybe we is. Should define those things because we yes. simply understand them because <laughs> we, we went talk the about program, them. Like, yeah, yeah, and it's so. understood. It's like we we have like our own. Because I'm language. pretty sure last time I checked, even Cal mm -hmm. State Long Beach doesn't have a public and oral history option mm -hmm. to test out in, and that's mm -hmm. that another reason why. You know, we randomly found out that Fullerton was really good. We yes. just got lucky. And not to deny that Cal State Long Beach isn't good. Mm -hmm. It's just, we, you know, they haven't integrated this portion into mm -hmm. their curriculum yet. Not to say that they won't. And right. I, I think they will soon. But, um, yeah, you know. They have, like, their research center. But it's, like, a matter of course offerings and it and I think it comes from the department sometimes and having an, an oral historian as part of their faculty and so when they hire we have to like I know with Fullerton they hired digital historians recently but they have a long history of hiring oral and public historians yeah. as a so legacy. So let's break down public history. So we history. should define these things. Yeah what is public <laughs> what history? Is that exact? And it sounds kind of <laughs> obvious because it's like okay the name association of public so we're historians who are publicly minded but like how so how do we differ from the academy of like a traditional historian who may follow into like a faculty tenure track role, um, which many public historians are, but there are those who choose not to go the academic um, traditional route and then they move into the museum sector. But even and the museum sector is yes, multifaceted. It is very different. And it, yeah. they call them like the lamb group because it's oh. libraries, archives and museums. Like they are oh, LAM. I have like never it's like heard a that. name acronym. <laughs> yeah. They're like, oh I work with a lamb and like it's like this like inner thing at conferences. They want to know how you practice your history degrees and um, yeah, so like in my case, I'm building a museum and practice history in the sense of I conserve and preserve local history and trying to capture um, this missing portion of Orange County's rancho heritage that has been done in part in certain areas, but where I am in 
former Rancho Nigel, where we're sitting yeah. <laughs> right now in the hills of Laguna. Like, literally, <laughs> sheep would have been <laughs> this very area a um, hundred plus years ago. And so what I'm doing daily is, like, trying to capture um, the written history, like the telegrams, the letters, the postcards, digitally remaster that into a content management system make them keyword text searchable so that once those items have like rich metadata, when we go and do our curatorial installations next year, we'll have a very in-depth look of like how 1800s was like locally with pioneer families and like what they conversed about, what their interests were. And there's more of like a paper trail, of course, then with societal, just tech um, and business operations. So now with born digital methods and like corporate <laughs> history and L- e- emails and things that are getting lost, we really have to, um, because we don't necessarily print things, we're not going to have even, I think there's even going to be a crisis if we don't continue to make an effort and just showing the change over time. And so like we're committed to creating like born digital materials like oral history videos and transcripts that allow people to hear firsthand accounts so the family members in the area and former rancho community who are agricultural workers to you know neighbors like the Irvines who were the molten contemporaries like to get a sense of what life was like it wasn't simply just different but how challenging like labor and um a day's work, <laughs> barbed wire fences and <laughs> wearing Wrangler jeans because you wrangled the, you know, cattle and you did brandings and roundups. And this is like really a strange thing to speak about because all this industry went farther north to like Santa Barbara or like farther south to San Diego, which the family has maintained like ranching industries to this day, which is another rarity. But like trying to get 22,000 acres of history, which is like post incorporation it was like yeah. many cities down to a T and to be able to do loans to each of those entities and the all the governing organizations like the Orange County Parks to colleges like Laguna College of Art and Design to the Playhouse and other fine art institutions that were benefactors to this kind of conglomerate of wealth of like if I'm a wealthy rancher maybe I should give back and it's like tracing that philanthropy of why and how and how society functioned then and today because we still need philanthropy obviously and Melinda and Bill Gates are a phenomenal portrait of like if you have a foundation um, you can certainly um, go digital like all their collections they work with archivists and historians to like go and save their personal Mm -hmm. memorabilia and then the There's Rockefellers. really no reason not to there isn't. in today's society with you all can, the technology we have. It's just brilliant, and it just helps everyone work together. And I read a, this article, it was in Town & Country, that this is a whole phenomenon of, like, the Rockefellers um, were, of course, one of the first to do this, where they document their memoirs, and that's kind of traditional. Everyone wants to remember their story, but where we differ in oral history is that, again, we are going grassroots level. It's the everyday perspective that's valued in comparison to, you know, a big portrait of the great man, so to speak, mm. <laughs> the great man of industry, the tycoon, <laughs> the, I, you know, icon of, yeah. of defining wealth. And so we want to raise awareness that you can't operate those entities without, you know, the society that allows them to function and and even just to kind of circle back around yeah. to the main question right. of this, the <laughs> podcast, which is, can you get a job exactly. with a history degree? That entire, you know, that last little thing that you were saying, mm-hmm. I was trying to keep track of how many titles you just mentioned. You I mean, you had a long list of essentially mm-hmm. all these different jobs that right. you, one person, have mm-hmm. with multiple history degrees. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, even right there, just right. you talking about all these different <laughs> aspects and, and fields that you are involved in, of course you can get a job exactly. with a history degree, whether it's the financial mm-hmm. side, the fundraising, mm-hmm. budgeting, collection mm-hmm. management, mm-hmm. archival science, and or, you know, I mean, philanthropy, mm-hmm. like you were talking about, it's the, the list goes on. It's incredible. There's and then, so much opportunity. Exactly. It's overwhelming. It's really, we see it yeah. in terms of that. So it's kind of... Like, if you see a need, you fill it. And mm-hmm. so I saw locally that there were certain projects that needed to get started, including, 
like museums wanted oral history projects, but they didn't have the tech understanding. And so like being fresh from the program, um, being able to institute several in the immediate area was wonderful because they, those continue to run. And then we, we love to start them. So this is my sister and I, Cindy, who co-founded 70 Degrees. So we're like, well, if they don't have the tools, we'll bring the tools to them. And we run workshops for like Soha just because like, it's like, how do you even start? It's a kind of an overwhelming task. Like, yeah. You may have a great idea, <laughs> great intent, like, oh, I'm going to go collect local people's stories and save them and share them. But the methodology and the training um, should be there before you start. And so like having partners helps people to consult and like really guide you. And like, that's why I started getting networked and joining OHA and SOHA it was like, well, on my own, I can do this much, but if I get a sense of place, purpose, tools, and how else we can um, grow these things and fund these things, how much better off these projects will be. And so I um, started getting more involved with that, and the National Council of Public History functions similarly, where as far as job placement, you know, they have agencies like those have listings, the AASLH for another, you know, job listing portal. So part of it is just knowing that there are networks that list positions. There are organizations locally, like nonprofit office, offices that list um, local opportunities, or just do the self-starter approach where I created my own job as a museum director because I saw a <laughs> need. I was like, you guys self-function? We have a great budget, but like I could yeah. definitely engineer some new programs, recruit interns. So like part of our structure I do is legacy, is like training the next generation, allowing them firsthand experiences with cotton gloves to care for collections and like do some of the metadata and so that they feel versed going into the field. Like, just like I was able to do that, I feel like that's the gift that keeps um, giving mm -hmm. back is that we cycle in these opportunities just like we were given. And so knowing that they're better prepared for the industry and as they go into graduate programs and um, career opportunities elsewhere around the country, it's like I'm, I was just delighted to work with them. And then they, of course, are learning this kind of behind the scenes aspect of what is actually on the shelves in an archive because we really, in matter of like museums, like it's always different percentages, which, which is permanent collection, which is primarily exhibited. But like, let's just say 10% is shown. Like there's that 90 to 80% that's always stored and waiting to be loaned out or do a new exhibition rotation. And so that's very true where the public may not even know what collections may look like because we're not often invited in to like look and peer in and ask those questions so like facilities are starting to do more tours with the curators and the conservators and like um, at the Huntington the conservators doing a live um, viewing of Blue Boy and it's like watch them in action oh. <laughs> like I'm so see excited. how they treat the materials <laughs> it's just amazing as it's an invitation to the public side for yeah but for you them bring up it. a really good point that I have no that I'm starting to notice and actually it didn't really click until mm. you were kind of saying you know mentioning how I essentially asked for this job that wasn't really there. Right, right. <laughs> but the job after description. Speaking, yeah, exactly, right? After <laughs> speaking weird. with you uh -huh. and, you know, Cindy and Ray, mm -hmm. I have noticed that that is, I think, a big kind of piece of advice we mm -hmm. should be giving our history yes. students right now is that the job you want, mm -hmm. it may not actually be posted. Exactly. Um, you know, I would. what I have noticed is that this tends to be a trend with the people mm -hmm. who are kind of breaking barriers in the history mm -hmm. industry right now is that, you know, don't be afraid to ask right. if that job is even a possibility sure. or if it's going to come up in the future. Go to those workshops, mm -hmm. go to the seminars, mm -hmm. go to these viewings and talk to them. Get I mean, because history them. is becoming, we are becoming a lot better at working with the public mm -hmm. and being more transparent and kind of giving the public that option to really talk to us and kind of bringing us yes. out of the archives, you know, like dragging yes. us out. <laughs> we're getting better at yeah. social media. We're, you know, it's a work in progress, right. but we're working on with our lab coats and all like dust right. protectors. It's like, hi, here we are with our yeah. magnifying glasses. And but I mean, it's scanners. true. Like the, one of the best jobs I ever got yes. was one that I asked for. Yes. It wasn't a thing. Presented. I mean, and bless his heart, you know, like, right. I, I don't really think he knew what was kind of coming towards sure. him when I showed up. And essentially like in my Offered. head, I'm like, I'm going to get a job. Yes. I'm going to leave you her knew. with a job. He didn't know what was, you know, kind of coming on 
hmm. to his doorstep, essentially. And this is in conservation, though, and that's that it's a very particular branch of public history. And in that field, even I feel like this is true mm-hmm. in public history in general, mm-hmm. but especially in conservation, it is there. There really isn't like one clear cut road no. to becoming a conservator. Right. So that was the only way I really knew how to get that job. But in retrospect, after speaking with you and my own experience and talking to all the different amazing people that we went to school with, I have seen that become a big trend, Mm -hmm. you know, that in today's society, not only in history, I would really urge everyone graduating to ask for the job you really want Mm -hmm. to go for it. And Mm -hmm. it may not be a reality. You may have to even create that job itself, but and create the need for it. So maybe it's a necessary thing of like showcase some of your skill sets. And, and it's part of like that with Kevin Cabrera, where he is the executive director at heritage (laughs) museum where he volunteered. And every time I look at their like social media pages and their website, like it's Kevin. Yeah. It's (laughs) great. He curated for a while and then it created a genuine institutional need to hire. And it was like, you see these progressions through your professional experiences, like to, you sometimes can get the board to ask you for that, like, Mm -hmm. resume for that description for that ask and so that was my case where I was just simply it was an internship it was like well here's all these things and um it's a pleasure (laughs) great working with you final board meeting and just signing off handing over all my data that I produced in the course of you know semester and they're like wait where are you going we kind of want to talk to you and it was like this elephant in the room which you know sometimes it just seems silly but yeah, being able to know your worth, to lean in. I think women and dominate right now in the um, museum sector. We've been doing a lot of studies, and there's it's really true. an amazing opportunity as far as, like, getting our chance to be heard and give back and really structure society through mm-hmm. these, like, communal spaces. And it's really amazing how much has changed within a relatively short period where um, I feel like, you know, it's really a, a place I'm understood and really getting – getting an opportunity to contribute to like this larger framework and so the thing is like Google is invested in this they have the arts and culture project and they have a database and partnership with museums all over the world they're in Paris and they're trying to engineer tech into this whole program because they realize arts aren't independent of society Um, like I always give the example of like Da Vinci, like he may have had a number of interests. He wasn't just an artist, you know, like he was a scientist and experiment and he just did a number of things. Like that's how we need to appropriate like the arts, how they function is like, we don't need to say like our disciplines don't need to be, um, so far across from us and like not understood because we should build more bridges and like work yeah. together collaborate if you're not the expert in the room work with someone who is exactly but helps. one thing I will say an area of criticism even mm-hmm. for our own I sure. mean as much as I love what right. I do I do think we have some room for improvement and you bring up a good point but as we're talking about this you know I'm realizing that our even the curriculum that we went mm-hmm. through they do not have classes in these other aspects of it. So maybe even rooms like room for improvement in the future, especially even at Fullerton, mm-hmm. because, you know, they're really leading the way in this industry. We could incorporate, you know, a business class, sure. negotiating, how exactly. to fundraise, uh, budget management, right. you know, or, <laughs> <laughs> Marketing. or like how we were mentioning yesterday, mm-hmm. actually maybe a required internship exactly. with municipal government exactly. because – you, I mean, now, not only building this new museum, mm-hmm. but having previously been a museum director, mm-hmm. you have run into all these issues with different city affairs mm-hmm. that I honestly had no idea we would even come into contact with, mm-hmm. like when we were going through school. Mm-hmm. But now when I think back at it, I'm like, well, if I went, if I could actually go back, I really wish that we had these type of classes Urban in training, addition. Training, yeah, right. because I mean, like we're talking about, the field is progressing and becoming a lot more interdisciplinary. Mm-hmm. So it to can't just. We have to evolve somehow. Kind of, it, I think it starts with the curriculum. Mm-hmm. Essentially, our students mm-hmm. before they hit the professional sector, you know, and but then that actually brings me to something too with my students. Um, you know, we've been talking about all these different careers mm-hmm. that yes. people can get into with a job. 
but let's kind of take it a step back. <laughs> when I, as in it with you, because you have really taken off and become very, you know, prominent and, and influential within the public history sector, and I kind of went more the academic route. So now with my students, I am essentially when we, our objective as history professors is not only to make our students subject matter experts, mm -hmm. but we also have to tell them how to market their skills and what are the skills that you leave with from a history course that can transfer into any yes. field. So I'm curious kind of from you with, you know, now you guys are actually creating this new museum too from the ground up. If you were to interview mm -hmm. a new student, you know, recent history grad, what type of new skills would you really be looking for beyond like the obvious you know, research skills, sure, historical writing, <laughs> historical <the> theory, <laughs> or, right. you know, what are the new type of skills that history students should really be marketing on their CV and sure. in interviews? I really think digital history trends mm. are very important. So being versed in new types of media, filmmaking, um, Adobe, the whole suite. So from Photoshop to Premiere to InDesign for doing in-house publications and maybe we work with like in our case we have someone designing and collaborating with that but I like being able to edit and revise those internally myself and have samples to to actually present and so like I think being um, versed in the networks that we um, as professionals present at conference level really help so if they've been to a um, conference and seen what the wider network looks like and who like what are the other programs out there their familiarity of like how wide our practice is really helps me so that um, they get a sense of what kind of opportunities there are so I can help them better prepare for kind of the real world yeah. <laughs> of like transitioning <laughs> from college degree bearer to maybe graduate school to um, their careers and so Right, because it's um, one it's thing to get a C in a class, right. another to like lose ten thousand dollars. Exactly. So, right. Big difference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we need to know, you know, that they're coming into it with correct um, experience. Exactly. And, and skills. Some sort of like nonprofit experience helps. Yeah. So if they have some sort of career that they've already created while they're in school or volunteering at organizations, um, that really helps because it shows not only responsibility to like give back but um self-starter in that so like anytime um i see volunteer experience i treat it as work experience and so like internships are a great ways <laughs> to I will tell provide that <laughs> as an intro to what's to come so like it helps with because they receive on-site training and nonprofit management really it is very much still business operation we still file to the irs we still have a CFO, CEO, and um, they operate in, in those terms. And so it's not like because we have that status, it's actually harder because of the exemption. Like we have to be the yeah. transparency with our filings and just making sure people understand where the, the investment is going. So, um, so it's like really basic record keeping. It's be key, spot on. right? Be able to draft <laughs> proposals. Like if you can like write a budget, a proposal, and execute oh, that, that's right? just a grant proposal. Amazing. Oh, so, yeah. I really needed to focus <laughs> right. more in that. Class. Yeah, so that's great. <laughs> now yeah. I'm like, oh, I really need that. Revisit <laughs> with the notes from the course, and then oh, that's gosh, the thing. Going to a, pro a reputable program, it's like you get these mentors that are readily available beyond just the classroom. So I stay in touch with the, you know faculty because they of course are present at some of these conferences but yeah. then they collaborate and contribute to a number of ways and then they send their students so like that's what's so really exciting right now dr Janssen's running the internship program right now he introduced me at one of our events to a student and now she's interning here in the summer and so it's like that's how these opportunities are presented is like being active in your department's events join phi alpha theta we have the little Bethan, so be a part of that mm -hmm. publication. Thank you, Paulette, right. for telling me to do that. <laughs> because that is a career of writing and publishing. You know, gosh, should I tell you the story that? about how I got into the no. little Bethan? Let's hear that. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Paulette essentially. <laughs> so, okay, Paulette is my best friend. Um, and I met her when I was getting my bachelor's. And um, it was really funny because I was like, 
eh, you know, I don't really know. Like I was just kind of finding my way and I had no idea if I wanted to go to grad school. And she goes, have you ever heard of the Willoughby? And I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, no. And she's like, well, they have this little meeting, you know, after class. Let's just stop by. And we go there. It's not just a little meeting. Right. You know, like they're, they're very recruiting formal. everyone. Right. And it's a legitimate, like, this is what you got to mm-hmm. do when you're an editor. And then somehow it turned into, that's just go take a look to we left and I was an editor on the yes. journal and I'm like what Wait. just happened like I just wanted to get through this semester sure. in one piece exactly. and now all of a sudden I have to learn how to become an editor for Manage a historical group, journal right? Right. Right. I was like what just happened she was like haha sorry <laughs> <laughs> kind of tricked me into it like like but now I mean you're honestly you're better prepared oh, to submit gosh. your scholarly articles yeah. your publications like I mean, at that the time experience. I was like oh my gosh Paula I just Thanks. got like so much work to do now on top of my homework but it hands down was one of the mm-hmm. best things I ever did Those- those yeah. things are irreplaceable, those early, like, learning yeah. experiences. Because like, it's learning. not just, like, you actually learning right. how to become a better writer, researcher. Too. Yeah, like, but then it's, like, you actually have to teach other people how to edit. And you learn the process mm-hmm. of even getting something published. And printer, like, physically tangible of all that work is really rewarding. Yeah. So, like, from start to finish, you see a whole mm-hmm. project done. Like, my like, very first – it was – it's kind of funny because the very first – history paper mm-hmm. I ever got published I the first time I did submit it to the Willoughby and didn't get it you know to second time didn't mm-hmm. get it third time finally got it and it was just like even as an editor on that journal mm-hmm. the standards were so high yes. that you know I had to work so hard just to even get that first history mm-hmm. paper published Publish. but now it's it beyond prepared me mm-hmm. for submitting anything for publication mm-hmm. now because review it's like, processes oh gosh so familiar <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and yeah. then it came back to Paulette too because now I, I email her all the time like can you edit this can oh, you like see this? now we're peer editing forever <laughs> yeah. which is great I mean that whole Chicago manual never leaves you it's by it your doesn't. bedside it's by your office <laughs> that good side. orange like, book it's still right you'll by use me. it for all your writing samples too oh, for, it's just it's definitely. forever it's part of our mm-hmm. training for a reason so yeah, yeah. but um and then uh, not only this but this is actually something I really wanted to get your your perspective on because it's almost frightening something that's going on within our society right now and I recently heard about this going on even at our old stomping grounds at Fullerton and that is essentially this push throughout the Cal State Mm -hmm. system to eliminate humanities majors Mm -hmm. and there was even I think it was like in 2014 maybe 2015 there was actually a legitimate discussion going on about taking away the option of a history major and only offering United like American studies or European Mm -hmm. studies I mean, thankfully that didn't happen. How horrible would that have been? But to me, I am just absolutely terrified to even hear that that is something still going on. But on the other side of that, I'm very proud to hear that all of our former professors at Fullerton Mm -hmm. fought back and really protected the humanities too. But the fact that this is even going on. conversation. Yeah. I feel like it's just maybe it's a, a response to our social history activism like a sense of maybe it's like a rebuttal like maybe they want to silence (laughs) I'm not sure it's motive but from my understanding of most politicians they either have a degree in poli sci or history so it would definitely shake up the institution if that ever (laughs) happened because I don't know where they would get their theoretical training for service public service so yeah that's really odd to me that's essentially very very strange our whole nation rests on that so yeah I don't think it's viable but certainly we do need to be active I think knowing what's happening on a state level in Sacramento being able to like be um, submit letters and be concerned um, citizen and just like stay like aware and there are like um, national archives and like the FOIA Act the Freedom of Information Act they're trying to create like national transparency with Sunshine Week like all of our papers are supposed to be widely available but current administration of course wants to censor some of that and so they've taken the stand um, as part of just a department that it's a Supreme Court ruling, like we need to be aware and have allow access to information. And so it's mainly like that's my bigger concern is like not so much that they take that 
discipline away, but the fact that they would, um, there's even a concern of like censorship in general, like the lack of information and access to it is dangerous for a society. And so like, I always see librarians as partners in this, like where they are providing resources, you can self educate, you have continued education and mm -hmm. uh, facilities because they are on the ground, you know, level where they're keeping society informed and so like I really that's my biggest concern really about society in general is like our it's it, because it's much digital censorship. they could just yeah. shut it down it's a sense of you know shutting down some servers and you know our web is so fragile in a way we take it for granted so I still use print medium <laughs> you know it's like <laughs> yes that's still old school but it works and you can yep. still learn I mean, if I there's a the digital, energy like version of books and <laughs> exactly I buy my real keyword book. <laughs> searchable is you know the digital trend i love it we will always need like ocr to text searchable functions i mm -hmm. love it but i think in the sense of like society um it likes to burn books you know it's just that's just a trend it's always like a, a thing and i we have these fears. Very scary trend. Because what comes after is right. not good. It's not a pretty picture. And that's why historians I mean, burned all of the books. Right. We see trends and you're like, wait that's a second. A scary that's thing. odd. Should be a red flag to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Pay attention. Don't let them censor books or knowledge yeah. or information. Because that's but really even that terrifying. Too, in this age of I mean, on one hand, I get why people don't like history mm -hmm. because it puts you face to face with, with the truth. Reality. Mm -hmm. It's and it's not easy. And when we're in the age of filters and we yes. can essentially we can completely mm -hmm. determine how we are per, like perceived yeah. throughout mm -hmm. society. So that's not easy. I get it. But in the age of censorship, where this is not only I mean, and I hate to say it, but it does happen even in academia sometimes. This is exactly when mm -hmm. you need to be investing in your yes. historical studies and the humanities majors because they are the ones who keep censorship in check, mm -hmm. essentially. They're the ones who are going to fight back. Exactly. And history students learn, like, leave the class, all, any of their classes, with the ability to not only find true so like resources, primary and secondary, but to think for themselves, mm -hmm. to think beyond you know what the media is telling them, and that is a skill that really it is. is priceless. It and is. we need that mm -hmm. because it's the like we we're talking about kind of almost this infrastructure and foundation of our society. And I know instant gratification is nice. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love that I can buy my groceries on an app if I really yeah. wanted to. <laughs> With the but, drone delivering yeah. it, you know, it's like, I mean, that's it's great. Nice, but it's, we have to be mindful that technology, yeah. it's its a tool. It is a tool. Don't it's not let the it. Solution. Yeah. I love trends. Like, we discuss VR, 3D printing here, and yeah. like catering to the next machine learning application because I think our whole world in which we operate will be transformed and the Smithsonian does this sort of thing already with their 3D lab and you know we see this where VR um, happens and just like certain museums again like Smithsonian where they're trying to increase attendance through an online platform and so they're thinking access and sharing their repository and like technology can be such an asset and just like we have to value those um, resources by a accessing them and then telling those people who make them widely available thank them encourage them and then the third part is fund them so once we do become successful in our respected fields like don't forget that mm -hmm. <laughs> these are the very places that informed us to think differently about society and that's kind of like where I am thinking about now is like how do we get corporations where I know some of them are history majors and they were active in Phi Alpha Theta. Like when I speak with them, that's a common experience. Um, how to fund departments, how to fund nonprofits, how to redirect some of these things because it's an incentive for them as a, a business that they do get tax write off. So there's always a good reason to, just from a financial standpoint, but just the pure satisfaction of knowing um, that you're giving back and that matters. And so I think that's like the next phase is not only breaking that mold of um, just making a career viable, but like feeling that we can help and giving our time is an asset too. I think we often forget um, in terms of volunteerism um, because they, they say that, thank you, it's, your time is valued. It, it's such a high mark because especially having advanced understanding of these places, like if we go and volunteer at certain 
place and can make high impact mm -hmm. and to those organizations. And if they would have hired a consultant, think about all those fees and mm -hmm. <laughs> things that they're saving, and they know that. And so, like, there's a way, and this is what I'm trying to do is, like, as in my role um, with SOHA, it's a volunteer board position um, to work into their presidency is, like, it's something you can't compensate the network and like supporting something an agency that helps inform people helps sustain off like collections helps fund students and their involvement we have scholarships and grants that get things moving forward mm -hmm. and so like i i really believe it and i'm trying to live it and that's why i say it because i i really hold this like conviction that we just have to keep helping those coming into the field and then keep learning from those who've been farther along. And we're kind of with our age bracket, like in the middle, we're <laughs> transitioning. <laughs> and it's a perfect place to be active in both groups, yeah. like to help interns realize and then rely on our mentors to guide us because we are still new in this industry and it's changing. So borrowing from the theoretical training that they have and it's just amazing to see it as like a huge timeline that way. But I think yeah. that's important is to give back in some capacity. And so, but that's why I think there's many ways of doing that. It's not just a financial thing. It's many other options. And so, yeah, I think we can, we can keep increasing awareness. We can um, frequent museum sites and um, that admission fee goes to operations. So like, feel great that you not only become more aware of, of you know, a theme <laughs> that day, but you're supporting an agency that really yeah. is designed um, to um, support a, a number of things. Well, yeah, it's so designed it's, to give back. Yeah, and to pay memberships forward. too. I'm like, that's my next day. I'm like joining. I'm like, now let's make a financial commitment and I can come back as much as I want to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to me, I think it's better than Disneyland. <laughs> I would I have, agree. Like, <laughs> way too member men membership cards, and I laughed Sometimes at one I point. I think Disney won't get fun again until yes. I become a parent. I know? wonder or about like, that, like that shift, yeah, of like child. I I'm like, because sometimes I go there, like when I had a pass yeah. a few years ago, exactly. it was really fun. You know, mm -hmm. you go on Frequent. one ride, you get mm -hmm. like a hot chocolate or something, and uh -huh. now it's like, uh, no. <laughs> now there's a lot of, a lot of people, yeah. it's hot, it's and I'm changing. like, I want to go back to my archive. <laughs> yeah, it's nice and cool in there. Yeah. People know me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. my friends. All my white gloves yeah. where I feel comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, to, you know, kind of emphasize everything you're saying, this is not only true about, like, what we were talking about today, but in American history mm -hmm. as well, in a capitalist society, money doesn't just talk. Mm -hmm. It screams. Yes, <laughs> so it does. Spend it on right. things you really want mm -hmm. to invest in and That's that great. you want in the future. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, like that is just the reality of our nation that we're in a capitalist society. We got to work with what we got, and and I'm not saying it's good or bad. Right. You know, I it's am structure. a proud American, mm -hmm. but it's like, well, we also have to be realistic about what we're dealing with, and we cannot really thrive even in the history industry without true knowledge mm -hmm. about financing. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, especially today, Absolutely. it's becoming even more of a fundamental skill, mm -hmm. I think, with because of all of this new, the digital aspects to public history. And um, yeah, and there's actually one question that's really been kind of pressing on me lately, that, or I guess that just kind of is like on repeat mm. in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and you were one of the, per like the first people I was like, I think she would know how to answer this a lot better than I would, you know, and that's essentially... I'm noticing that, like you said, there's this generational shift within academia and within the public history sector. But I'm curious about what do you think, you know, are the the new responsibilities essentially of historians mm -hmm. in the digital mm -hmm. era? You know, because we've talked about, I mean, historians are not exactly known for moving very fast. Right. You know, we move kind of at a snail's huh. pace. Right, we, we watch <laughs> and yeah. <then> we record. <laughs> But the digital right. era moves it's at lightning great. speed. So right. how do we adapt? I, I think that's just it. It's just staying true to the academy, but new skill sets. So mm -hmm. if we reach, if our concern is audience, we reach them through social media platforms. We are able to translate our messages in a new way. And learning, like, tools like WordPress and access is a huge thing. So, like, interfacing UX user design how would we modulate our 
you know, we're creating digital repositories, but they don't live in isolation. They need servers. They need a space, a web space to like actually sit on and display the collection to make those things searchable. And so um, for me, like that was part of my um, initiative was to become more versed in like computer science and like if the trend is STEM, work it. <laughs> Learn work those with skills. It. Work with it. Don't fight against Don't it. Don't fight the trend because that's existing. Change the institution from within. Um, learn the skill sets that the next generation are expected to know how to do, like coding and just like become familiar. Mm -hmm. Like there's code.org so that classrooms can start experience that. that like hey <laughs> if you like to be a programmer someday here's a simple interface and google has a curriculum designed to do early education so they know that they're going to recruit this next group mm -hmm. um i think we need to build curriculum honestly that's attractive to this generation that they understand our methodology introduction to all this so that just like these kind of high-tech sectors are giving them a glimpse I think part of it's working on a district level. Like right now, we're trying to engineer a partnership um, with um, the local district here, and we have support, like through, through local schools, to test pilot our programs. And so it's like you work with the system that is there, and then you build bridges to end, like organizations that do it so well. Like the San Juan Capistrano Mission has an amazing like program with their passports that the kids, you know, buses of children, you know, day after day and experience that. And so like working with sites um, as part of your curriculum is key. So like OC Parks has a few historical places you can visit, um, get to know the staff there. I think we can build joint curriculum. I think if it's all these different agencies supporting it, we're more likely to be utilized in the classroom. So if we have all the stamps of approval, like how brilliant would that be? And so like that's my biggest vision right now for a county level is like the department to recognize that our local smaller agencies have great resources for them and like making our voice count, you know, and with their votes literally get people elected. So part of it is becoming active in the, the system. So mm. becoming part of that go core. Vote. Yeah, go vote. Become a, yeah, be part of a local council. So like if you don't like the way education is being taught locally, go make a difference. Volunteer in the classrooms to see what the challenges are. It's disheartening, I know, just to bear witness to the societal changes. So if with mass shootings and such, and I know that topically will lead into um, some of your other pre presentations and mm -hmm. conversations with this podcast series. And so I understand it to be a crisis, really, in the education system in terms of safety. Um, so we need to help. We need help by reminding society, history's purpose, yeah. educating um, core values in our, our lessons. We have, you know, case studies, but if we explain our society's you know national narrative state and level love like narrative and kind of the creeds in which individuals live by you know teaching um those like morals and like values and life lessons i would hope that with these case studies like maybe it would reduce all the, the challenges that we're facing as a nation and so we really um it's never just one person's responsibility that's a parental issue i think um, a factor of getting involved in and in really mentoring one's children. Um, but I think the education system works alongside that and, you know, deeming certain things um, as necessary. And those, it's usually in early education that that happens. And so, you know, just it matters um, for us to get involved. And um, we parents can do that with their own children and with their classrooms and providing avenues like. The, I know teachers need additional support for doing site visits, so volunteering, creating a, like a group of historical interest group, let's say, mm -hmm. and say, let's go visit <laughs> these places together. Let's have our children see local history um, beyond the classroom sometimes. I think sometimes I remember those early moments as being so instrumental to why I have this like, career was going to sites that were like demonstrating how society functioned, Native American society of like, this is their abode and this is how they made meals. And so simple mm -hmm. in terms of like understanding another society. And I think if we train our children to think 
not only recognize the differences, but the shared value of friendship and family and core that they can learn from watching other societies. Like historians are, they borrow anthropology in that way. Like we show those bigger trends of what makes us human and like those things happen at a museum site. And so we all work together. We just have to get out there and get active. And exactly. it's a big responsibility. But yeah, and you used a, a really important word. I think, you know, to kind of add to that question as well, some of the new responsibilities we do have to get more active mm -hmm. in not only protecting our field, advocating for mm -hmm. it, but um, in our society in general and actually really, you know, determining what our values are, what we stand for, what we stand against and protecting them because we have, there have been times throughout our nation's history where we have been very fortunate to not have to be so active, mm -hmm. but when our field essentially is being attacked, not only the theology or approach or, but our actual students mm -hmm. are being attacked, mm -hmm. we do have to get more active. The reality of the world is that things have changed and academia and the public history sector do have to adapt, you know, while still remaining essentially our, who we really are mm -hmm. and protecting our core values, but we can't just step aside and trust right. you know that it will all work out <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> and as historians we know that it's doesn't happen <laughs> so we do have to kind of stand up and I think it starts with uh, you know us mm -hmm. and leading by example for mm -hmm. our students actually you know like hey uh it because for me whenever I had a professor and I found out you know they're actually involved in all these other things and they really are advocating for me and my education that meant the world mm -hmm. to me. Yes. And now as a professor myself, yes. it's like I feel like it's not only a responsibility, but it's something I really cherish and kind of feel humbled by. But I take that it's seriously, wonderful. paying it forward mm -hmm. to future students exactly. and making sure they have a chance to actually thrive in this field and that it survives throughout the technical or digital era, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But wow, thank you wonderful. so much, Jennifer. Oh, pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for the platform and the opportunity to speak <laughs> with you. I think this is lovely. And thank you what you do in the classroom because I know you're instilling generationally some important key themes. Thank you. And, you know, That's it's so wonderful sweet. that <laughs> you don't feel that. like that. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a career by choice. And it's like sometimes I they remember, say it's a calling. Oh, you gosh, know, it's, I remember McLean. Mm -hmm. I took one of his uh, British history classes. Yes. And he told me, I will never, ever forget this, but he said, history is a calling. Uh -huh. It's something that picks huh. you. And I was like, it huh. just clicked. I'm like, That's wow, what it is. No that makes so this. much sense. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. <laughs> like sometimes mm. it's, you feel like you're, you know, you're not making a lot of progress, but sure. that means a lot. Thank you. Yeah, for really saying wonderful. That. And I actually have a few students I think would be very, you know, who would thrive mm. in this industry. So if an internship um, pops up, yes. I'm going to be selfish okay. and ask that you would send me an email because I got some students in mind who oh, I think would great. do really well, okay. especially with, I mean, and you taught me so much about just how to create a museum from the ground up is insane. I have a lot of respect for Thank you. Thank you very much. That. It's yeah. in process. So the fun thing is it's being <laughs> documented and hopefully will get published at some point in, in its oh, truest sure form of how things evolve because it's it's a, an endeavor of many, and so I really i am grateful for all the strategic planning and partners like yourself who advise and give feedback on managing collections because that is our asset is, you know, the collections care and how we manage those things. Um, we're the fiduciaries of that. Like, it's our literally our role for society to take <laughs> care of that, and that when you understand that it's for everyone and, like, it's, like, an amazing kind of sense of respect for time and place and pioneers, but like the treatment. So that's why we do this like certain like care in what we do. And mm -hmm. um, it's amazing. I just love it. So I hope people will <laughs> take a chance to like do some more um, research as to who we are and what we do and get involved because I, I know it's been very valuable for us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you so Thank much, you. Jennifer. <laughs> Pleasure. Thanks. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the first episode of The Makeup Historian. Be sure to subscribe so you can get notified every time a new episode of ours comes out. Take care.